unsolved murders and disappearances by nature generate their share of speculation. But the way Shirley and Russell Derman died, the way their bodies were found and what had been done to them as they both neared their 90th birthdays, well, it was beyond heinous. But speculation, pure guesses are all there is to go on, all there is to chase in a murder mystery that begins on the first weekend in May 2014. Since then, one man, a county sheriff in Georgia's Lake Country, has led the search to find their killer, or killers. This is the story of that hunt. The Dermans had three adult children, two sons in Florida and a daughter in North Carolina. A fourth child, a son, Mark C. Dermond, who had been their eldest, was murdered in the year 2000. The circumstances surrounding his death drew the immediate interest of investigators. Mark Derman had been shot in the neck and torso while buying crack cocaine in downtown Atlanta the night of his 47th birthday. His killer remains in prison, and people on that slaying's periphery, relatives, friends, and others, appear to have played no role in Russell and Shirley Derman's deaths. Obviously, we looked, once we heard they had a son that had been murdered in some sort of a drug deal, we jumped right on that. Uh... He was killed, he and another fellow had gone, he was a drug addict like so many people have in their families. This is somebody who got hooked on drugs, you know, drugs and was perpetually doing something, parents bailing him out time and time again. And I've worked, I can't tell how many cases I've worked like this. Then he starts stealing from his parents, you know, and and stealing his mother's jewelry and forging checks and things like that. And then finally you graduate on up to doing that to strangers. And finally he graduated on up. He actually did a robbery up in New York uh, and and did a little time uh, on a robbery charge up there. But had been in and out of rehabs and things like that and apparently was back in Atlanta. uh, And... uh, I, I highly suspect he had some money his parents had given him for his birthday. I have no way of, you know, knowing that. But he was killed. Uh, he and this other fellow went over to buy dope. The guy on the street that day apparently was not a seller of drugs, but a robber of drug customers. They pull up, uh, and this guy opens fire on both of them and takes some money. The other guy, the passenger in, in Mark Norman's car, lived. Uh, and the man, there was a man convicted of it and sent to prison for life. He's still in prison. Um, uh, this man was not a drug trafficker. He was not a smuggler. He was not a cartel. He was a typical dope addict, just a typical dope addict uh, who, you know, uh, he got shot one day. The Dermans did not attend the funeral. I mean, that, excuse me, they did not attend the trial. They took no part in the case. There would have been no animosity uh, by the defendant who was convicted of killing him because uh, they never you know, had any uh, dealings with it at all. Uh, they had, I, I, I hate to speak for the dead, but I mean, it appears to me for all practical purposes, they had finally just kind of washed their hands and done everything they could. And uh, so that was the, that was that, and there's no nexus uh, in any way to this murder and that. You know, it's just, it just didn't. You know, I called the prison. We got his, even then, even though I knew what I've just told you, we got with the prison. We saw who was visit. He actually hadn't had any visitors in the, or anything in a while. This guy hadn't. He had a wife. She, I talked to her. She called me many times. She, of course, proclaims his his innocence but most people that are related you know most people that are related to people in the chain gang assert their innocence too sills and his investigators are not muddling along in the dark progress in the case has been made 
There have, since early on, been developments and findings that, as in any criminal probe, have not been shared with the public. What Sills has not been shy about revealing, however, is that someone has reported seeing an unknown man on the Dermond property May 3rd. The Saturday authorities believe the couple was killed. Even so, it is still not clear, and it never may be, just how Russell Dermond was killed. He could have been shot, beaten, or suffered some as-yet-unknown end. The fact that his head is missing has hindered the investigation to some extent, at least to tell how he was slain. He was decapitated after he died. Authorities do know that much. Shirley Dermond, meanwhile, died of blows to the skull. She was struck more than once and was dead when her body was sunk miles from her home in the waters of Lake Oconee. I still have some tangible physical evidence that I won't discuss. I, uh, we definitely have a witness who saw a man uh, in their yard on the day we suspect the murders occurred that we've never been able to identify. Uh, uh, we still don't know uh, exactly how Mr. Nerman was killed. Uh, Ms. Nerman, as you well know, it was, was it 15 days. Her body surfaced. Uh, whoever killed Mrs. Nerman did not intend to, for her body to be found. There were two cement blocks tied to her body to weight her body down. Uh, obviously, who and, and the body was found some six approximately five and a half to six miles away near the dam in extremely deep water where it came up. Uh, the profession, you know, the, the, the perpetual thought of people that, that this was a professional job, uh, uh, the fact that her body was weighted down with two, two cement blocks tells you that it wasn't too professional because the, the gases that built up under the skin and things like that of the body were still able to bring the body to the top even though there were 30, 30 pounds of uh, 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 cinder block tied uh, to her body, uh, you know, that, that she still came up. And uh, yes, yeah, she was beaten to death. She was uh, multiple blows to the head. I'm not saying it was a hammer, but it was something like a hammer or something, or it could even be a stick or something, that the way it was. It isn't really Sill's way to speculate, to have theories, guesses. He likes to say, work the evidence, follow the clues, work what you know, what you have, damn the whys. And you could easily get caught up in the esoterics, and you need to stay away from that. You need to go with what you have and what you know. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, I know there was no forced entry. I know that the evidence indicates they knew who it was because there was no struggle. Mr. Derman, you know, his personality, as I've been able to discern it over investigating him, you know, he was an 88-year-old guy. He'd been a World War II veteran in the Navy. Uh, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to be coarse and gruff. He certainly wasn't uh, afraid to state his opinion. Uh, and I, from what I know about him, uh, given his age and his background, I, I don't think that he would be the guy that would have gone easy. Uh, uh, and uh, so the evidence shows that it was some, you know, somebody they knew at least knew in some. And when you get, when you you got to understand when you're somebody that you know, uh, you know we have workers and things that, and I'm not saying that it's a worker, but you have workers and things that come to your house that you know, you know, people that you might not invite over for dinner, but you'd certainly open the door and let them in your home. I mean, somebody that showed up like that, that you would open the door and come in and say, you know, hey, how you doing? What you, you know, can I help you? What you need or something like that? But different than you know, family or close friends that would, uh, you know, socialize with you in some way. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident of that. Uh, I'm confident 
based on what I know, that these people have no ties to organized crime or, or any criminal activity that I can discern. These were old people who had not worked in a decade, uh, who led fairly sedentary lives. They had a definite routine. You know, when you look at everybody's bank records and credit card records for a period of seven or eight years, you, you can pretty much pick out their routine. And uh, she devoutly played bridge in the local bridge club, you know, every week. He had played golf on a regular basis uh, for many years, although he'd stopped. His next door neighbor, who had predeceased him, uh, uh, they had fished together and things like that, and he, they no longer had a boat or anything like that. I mean, I, I, I'm confident that uh, that I can find no enemies, yet this crime screams out for an enemy, uh, a vicious enemy. Uh, and that's one of, if not the most perplexing things about it. This type of crime, uh, not random, a random crime like this for, you're, gonna, you're in an exclusive, gated community. The random crime occurs just off the interstate or a major thoroughfare or in an urban area that, of high traffic like that. That's not what we have here. Yes, was the home accessible by water? Yes, the perpetrator could have come by water. But this is uh, this is not a navigable well, I mean, when I say navigable, I don't mean you can't get to the ocean from Lake Oconee when I say navigable. Uh, you know, random crime perpetrated by, by water is as rare as decapitation and taking the head in Putnam County. And uh, so it's, uh, I mean, that's just highly unlikely. Uh, Sills has suggested that perhaps, maybe, the Dermans had something that someone else wanted, or, on the other hand, that maybe the Dermans didn't have what their killer wanted. We don't know of anything that was taken from the Dermans' home. And I have to rely on their adult children. Uh, there was no safe present. That's not to say there wasn't a safe there that was removed, obviously. I don't think it would have been a big safe or something like that. But according to the children, I mean, there were Rolex watches, there was money, there was, I don't mean a tremendous, but I mean, th there were things there that would have been taken by the random street criminal that does a home invasion or something like that. They wouldn't have left those things behind. Nothing was taken according to them. But then again, I don't know. I don't know what was there. You know, at this point in time, I, my mother later raised me you know she was we were moving her uh, from an uh, apartment to an assisted living thing and things like that and I, I could tell you major pieces of furniture that were in her house and apartment but I couldn't tell you about anything else I, I mean and this this is the case with their children I mean, I mean, they knew what was there, but there certainly was nothing. But then again, I have to say to myself, you know, uh, maybe, you know, because of the exclusive nature of the community, the reputation for wealth, uh, they were targeted for that, and they thought they had something that they didn't have. Maybe somebody uh, did that, and of course, Maybe they did have something that was, you know, extremely valuable and extremely liquid. Uh, you know, if you got the damn Mona Lisa at the house, it may be worth a lot, but, you know, you know, Fred and Billy, the two, you know, meth addicts, they ain't going to take Mona Lisa to the pawn shop, you know. And the dope man don't want Mona Lisa at his house. He'll take your flat screen. 
you know, but the Mona Lisa, somebody gonna call the sheriff and say, you know, Tyrone over here, the dope dealer, he's got Mona Lisa. Some <laughs> two crackheads brought him to Mona Lisa, and it's not gonna take long for me to get that word in a small community. And that's just not happening. And when you have a case of this, and when you have a case of this magnitude, this cruelty is when it comes to people of this age, this publicity, let me tell you something. Every hoodlum in the state of Georgia knows what. This is a ticket. It's the ticket. Well, it's maybe not be the ticket that's going to get you out of a murder, but it's going to get you out of a lot of other crimes lesser than that. And let me tell you something, a hoodlum knows that ticket and they're going to play it. They're going to say, you know, you got me for three burglars over here, I'm on probation, and I know who killed the Dermans, and they're not going to hesitate picking up that phone. They won't hesitate to be standing in your yard in the morning when you come out. And, and so, and we have not had that response on this case. I've worked a lot of murders, as you know, in my career. Let me tell you something. When it's a, it's a high-profile crime, the criminal community knows they have a bargaining tool. They know the value of it, and information will erupt. And unfortunately, there has been no Vesuvius uh, connected with the Dermot case, and there would have been. You know, I had a big dope dealer over here not, n not long after that, a guy who'd been... Uh, prison I don't know how many times uh, Aryan Brotherhood type hoodlum major meth dealer type thing and we hit him one night and caught him caught him right and uh, it was what, 2 o'clock in the morning type search warrant and I walked in and he said oh Lord did you look who's here he said uh, I sat down by him there in a chair while my detectives were finishing up the search, and he said, I don't guess there's anything I can do to get out of this one, is it, Sheriff? And I said, well, and he said, he shook his head, and he said, Sheriff, if I knew you'd kill those two old people, I'd have jumped up and told you when you walked in that door. <laughs> and so off to the big chain gang, he went for a long time. If somebody in the criminal community, not just in the local criminal community, knew, you know, we'd be, and, and that, that, that's more of a mystique, you know, that, that's more of the targeted nature of the crime, as opposed to any kind of, and criminals that perpetrate random crimes like this almost always leave a mess, uh, and, and I realize, obviously, a body with a, to the layperson, an average person, a body with a head cut off of it may seem like a, a mess, but there really wasn't anything else disturbed. You sometimes hear in movies how killers took their time. Cliché as it may sound, the sheriff said that may have been the case here, that the bad guy or bad guys were in no hurry. But make no mistake, there is nothing cliche about the Dermans' deaths. You know, quite candidly, I can't prove that Mrs. Uh, there should have, based on the trauma to Mrs. Derman's body, there should have been some tangible evidence at the scene, okay, related to her trauma. Uh, there should have been some tangible evidence that was not there. So I, I don't even believe that there's a strong possibility that she was not murdered at that house. And and that's indicative of, of, of more than one person, you know. Maybe she was taken away, and if you want to, you know, when you start talking about theories, maybe she was taken away, and if you don't tell us where the pot of gold, the elusive pot of gold is, uh, we're going to kill her. And uh, what do you tell when there isn't a pot of gold? And that's, that all indicates multiple perpetrators or multiple uh, uh, co-conspirators or, or whatever. Uh, and so uh, 
in different locations and, 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 and things like that. Uh, I asked Sills again about security at the Great Water's entrance, what it was like back when the Dermans were slain. At that juncture in time, it would not have been anything like it is today. Today they have barricades, they, they have these arms like, well, not like a railroad, well, the same type of device at a railroad crossing. You've got, if you've got a decal, a barcode decal on your car, you can, it scans it, you can drive through if you're a resident, if you've got a sticker, otherwise the, the, they're keeping meticulous records, or at least appears to be that they're keeping meticulous records. At that time, as I said, if you had a decal, a Reynolds decal, you were waved through. Uh, and construction, I, I'm not saying that this was a construction worker, but all matter, real estate agents, construction, all kind of people had had decals. And so they were waved through. And of course, again, even though I don't think it was likely, although we, although Mrs. Derman's body definitely was disposed of by boat, uh, I, uh, the, the perpetrator certainly could have come by water. There's no, no doubt about that. And I can't articulate why I don't think that's the case. I, I just... I can't articulate why that. I think that's not the case, but I don't, you know. Uh, but clearly, her body was where it was and where it surfaced. We, you know, we we talked about decomposition with the lab. We talked to hydrologists at the University of Georgia and, and the Georgia Power and currents generated by generation and all this kind of stuff. This body did not float from the Dermans residence six miles down the channel of the Oconee River in the lake near the dam and then pop back up. Something I really wanted to know about was the unceasing hunt that goes on daily in the sheriff's own mind. I think about this every day. This is really the only murder I've not been able to solve in my long career. And quite candidly, it's somewhat embarrassing, you know. Uh, you know, all like you know that sitting in there in my office, and there's some over in Dave, another detective's office too, or you know, boxes of interviews, jump drives, CDs. I keep that pitch. I keep that. Uh, I keep that aerial of Reynolds, you know, propped up over in the chair. It stayed in the conference room, you know. For six months, this investigation ran like a damn P-51, like a V-12 motor in a P-51 Lightning aircraft. I mean, really, where really we didn't do anything. I, I literally didn't do anything else. I mean, I didn't. I worked seven days a week for three months, uh, and most of my other <laughs> detectives and, and people did too on nothing. I, I'm not saying I let the rest of the county go. I didn't, but I'm just saying this was, and, and for six months we're flying like a like a P-51 Mustang, and here we are three years later, and it's a popping John, if you know what I'm talking about. It's a, one of those old single-cylinder John Deere engines that pop. It's and I want to stress that, that analogy. I want to stress that analogy because that engine's still running, and it may be be hitting on one cylinder cylinder with centrifugal aid, like an old popping John one cylinder farm motor of some sort. But if I can get just a scintilla of something, that V-12 Rolls-Royce or Lycoming or whatever was in that P-51 will crank back up. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, the, you know, the Grinstead case, you know, uh, 12, what was it, 12 years later, somebody calls the GBI and, and says, so-and-so did it, basically. And that so-and-so was somebody they never, according to what I've read in the media, somebody they never even 
considered at all. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't take 12 years. This has been three years, and I, you know, my my colleagues and friends tell me, you know, you know, that you may get the call any day. I, I hope I get it, you know, 30 minutes from now. But uh, I, I, we keep going over this stuff. I'm I'm getting ready to make a trip out of state that I've been putting off for the last several months to go talk to some relatives and that I didn't even know were related to the Mr. Derman and the, the Dermans. Uh, not that I think that they know anything, but I, and I'm getting ready to go back and personally interview people that other people interviewed, you know, people that I didn't look in the eye. And not that I question, I'm not questioning the the interviews of that were done, but they had such a limited family, you know. Uh, Miss Norman had, they had three children, four, counting the one that was, uh, you know, one daughter in, in uh, Asheville, one son in Jacksonville, one son over in the Panama City area. And uh, uh, Ms. Norman had only one cousin uh, alive at the time, and uh, uh, Mr. Derman, uh, no other relatives. Uh, either, uh, per se. The sheriff himself is a connoisseur of news and history. He reads the Oxford American and listens to the Grand Ole Opry every Saturday night. He also listens to NPR. I wondered if he thought the killer kept up with stories about the case. Absolutely. It would be hard for anybody when you can... When you can sit in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean and a casual acquaintance you have made ask you about it the next day, when, and I presume, I don't remember telling these people that I was a sheriff. I, you know, my name was Howard Seals. I'm from Eatonton, Georgia. I don't think that I told them that I was even the sheriff. And then you go back with the, with the capabilities of our Internet today and then, you know, the next day or two days later you're asked about it there's no way in hell unless they are some sort of recluse living off the grid uh, that they're not keeping up with it and uh, but I know something else somebody else knows they did this you know and uh, uh, this is something else I'd wondered too was what Sills would say if he could somehow pass along a message to the bad guy. I don't think I can, I nor anyone else can convince a murderer into walking into the sheriff's office. I've convinced a few fugitives over the years to walk into the sheriff's office by relentlessly hounding their ass every day and being a few hours behind them from one end of Georgia or the southeast to another. But I, I, and none of those were wanted for murder. They were wanted for other crimes. But I don't think that there's anything I can say to them other than we will not quit looking for you. Uh, that's not going to happen, not as long as I'm sure. The sheriff imagines he will hear about the case by darn near everyone he meets, at least until he solves it, and especially if he doesn't. It is certainly, uh, you know me, I, I end up traveling around the state, around the country a great deal in my position, and I don't go nowhere where any of the, the first questions asked, uh, whether it's my colleagues, uh, other sheriffs, police chiefs around the country and other states, or whether it's some stranger I met the day before in Europe, uh, the question is always the same. Have you ever, you know, I was with the sheriff of Columbia County this morning just over here in, uh, near Augusta at another event this morning, and when we got through with the soiree that we were at, and we and he and I, nobody but he and I, were walking back to the, to my car before I left. He said, Clay, Sheriff Whittle, he, Clay said, tell me anything. 
That's all he said. Tell me anything. Has it been anything? And I knew what he, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, and uh, that's uh, for a sheriff or a person responsible for a case like this, that's pretty, uh, you, you don't have to worry about keeping your mind on it. Everybody else is going to remind you of it. As our conversation drew to a close, the sheriff brought up something obvious, and yet it lies at the heart of his investigation. One that is, to this point, an unsuccessful investigation, though one he'll never give up on. I wonder what the hell I've done wrong. Okay? Or what did I miss? What could I have done differently? I've talked, I could fill the biggest damn bluebird bus ever rolled out of Peach County with the psychics I've talked to. If you want to talk to me about the Derman case, I will talk to you. I will get my fat ass up and drive to Alabama to talk to you. Okay? I'll get on a plane and fly to Seattle. It doesn't matter. And it's just very, you know, 